Hello everyone, back again with our second installation on the Zamish variation of the Nimzo Indian Defense. So let's get at it. This game is our second game in the series and with the white pieces is a player named D. Yang versus Dean Ippolito who is an I.M with the black pieces and this game took place in 2010 so the game started off with d4 knight f6 c4 e6 knight c3 bishop b4 and as we are discussing the Zamish variation the immediate a3 Bishop takes c3 check, bishop takes c3, and our variation in particular, b6, f3, and white's plan is very obvious, to build a huge center, placing his pieces behind it, and hopefully culminating in a crushing king side attack but let's see what black has to say about it knight c6 e4 bishop a6 and if you watch the previous video the introduction you will understand that black's plan is to move the knight on c6 to a5 and along with the bishop on a6 to attack and win the pawn on c4 Yang played bishop g5 again in the first game we covered white had played bishop d3 and bishop d3 prepares prepares excuse me the defense of the c4 pawn with queen e2 which is a reasonable move idea. However, Bishop G5 is a bit more aggressive and sets up attacking ideas like E5, for example. This idea is especially dangerous because Black has parted ways with his dark squared bishop and therefore he cannot bring it back to E7 to break the pin. So, this pin on the f6 knight becomes a major issue for black to deal with in many lines. So, Dean Ippolito played h6, putting the question to the bishop to declare his intentions. And, of course, he wants to keep his bishop and the pressure on the position, so he plays bishop h4. Black would be very happy if white just played bishop takes f6 and queen takes f6. But only a beginning player would make such a move. So bishop h4, knight a5 again, directly attacking the c4 pawn. And you might be wondering or worrying about e5 here. Well, if e5 then black simply plays g5 here so that's not a, a worry but what I want you to think about in this position is a move like castling and again this is a warning for players that simply play by rope in this position castling is inadvisable. For example, e5, g5, bishop f2, knight h5, and h4. And black's king is stuck on the side where he really uh, rather not be. 
and you can see by this position that white is going to have fun attacking the king here and this is why you don't want to be in a rush to castle in such a position so here's another decent alternative to castling g5 bishop f2 and then queen e7 which prepares to castle on the queen side so for example h4 queen side castle d5 knight a5 there's that pressure on the c4 pawn c5 bishop takes f1 d6 c takes d6 c takes d6 queen f8 king takes f1 knight e8 piling up on the d6 pawn e5 protecting it f6 attacking e5 again queen d3 with the ideas of coming to uh, a6 king b7 rook b1 f takes e5 queen e4 check knight c6 bishop takes b6 a takes b6 queen e3 knight takes d6 queen takes b6 this game is not for the faint of heart queen a6 check knight a7 rook b6 and here believe it or not black is uh, actually better how is white to continue the attack here black played rook b8 when g4 was the move with the queen on f8 and king on f1 where after rook takes d6 uh, G takes F3 uh, would have followed but Rook B8 was played Rook takes D6 and then G4 Rook takes D7 threatening mate now on A7 and Queen C5 and this position is very very complicated but probably equal at this point and this was a real game from Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces versus Peter Laco and Monte Carlo 2007. And by the way, it was a blindfold game. And that shows you how strong these players are. The fact that they can play games blindfold with such great accuracy. So back to our game. Instead of g5 and instead of the um, awful move castles king side, Ippolito played knight a5, choosing the most direct approach, simply attacking c4. Again, black does not have to worry about e5 because he would just plays he would just play g5. Okay. So e5 was played, and Ippolito played g5. White played bishop f2. Um, just so you can see, e takes f6, g takes h4 is good with black, who is just going to follow up with the capture of the f6 pawn with his, with this queen going back a major alternative here is queen a4 as we saw in the last game uh, protecting this pawn on c4 and also with some kind of x-ray tactics against this bishop excuse me which is uh, hanging here so there's two alternatives here that we have to consider and uh, c5 
and uh, queen c8. Now, if c5 here, black has to be careful because he's he's in this pen. This queen is in this pen. So what would happen here is e5, attacking the knight. G5, all forced. Bishop f2. Knight h5, and then h4. So we can see that um, the dark squares are, have been weakened seriously because now that c5 has been played, notice the the holes that have appeared now on uh, d6 along with f5. And black has no dark squared bishop, so this bishop is going to become mighty. So the position uh, is not bad or losing for black, but white definitely has an advantage here going forward with with uh, such weakness. Okay. And it shows you how complicated chess is because in the last game, c5 was good there, but the circumstances were different. There was no pin on the knight on um, f6. The knight was on g8 at the time. So therefore, he didn't have that double weakness of playing g5 and c5. So, in this case, instead of c5, queen c8. <clears throat> and queen c8 has a double purpose. First of all, it takes the sting out of e5 because now the knight can just simply move. And that uh, connects to what I was just saying about making this additional move the weak in the king side. If e5, the knight can just simply hop out of the way without incurring further weakness. The second point is... Black's idea is to go queen b7 and then c6 with that same idea of pressuring the c4 pawn a third time along with the knight and bishop. So, just to give an example, again, black does not worry about the double pawns if uh, black gives up the bishop pair. So, after bishop takes f6, g takes f6 knight h3 queen b7 there's our plan queen b4 rook g8 bringing the rook to open file king f2 planning to move the bishop on d3 c5 and you might say, wait a minute, how can he do that? It's just a temporary pawn sacrifice which activates black's pieces. So after d takes c5, not pawn takes c5, the knight is hanging on a5. But simply rook c8. And again, we are looking at the c4 pawn. So after c takes b6, knight takes c4. Knight f4. Now, if bishop takes a7, then just simply queen takes a7, check, and um, white is lost. If he does king e1, he will be made it in short fashion after queen e3. And if queen c5, just simply uh, capture the queen. So, bishop takes, excuse me, b takes a7 as an error. So, knight f4. Rook c6, bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, hitting the queen, queen b2, and then black regains his pawn. A takes b6, queen d2, queen c7, attacking the weakness on c3 now, g4, f5, breaking the pawns open so that uh, black can attack the white king on f2. Knight h5, threatening a fork on f6. 
King e7, uh, responding to that move. And here black is already uh, better. But uh, white just makes a blunder which accelerates his defeat. So g takes f5 was played. And uh, can you see the idea? What just happened was white just helped black in his plans by opening up this file which formerly was only semi-open. So once he does that, this whole G file is cut off for the king to go back and simply queen C5. And there's nowhere for the king to go. If he goes here, the mean discovered check from the bishop on A6. Um, queen E3. Is simply meant by uh, yeah I just showed it to you. Queen e3 is simply meant by rook g2, drawing the king away. And uh, last move king e1 is meant by rook g2. Okay. And again, those are two grand masters. White resigned in the game. Uh, Hoffman, uh, Pantala, Hari Krishna, and Coletta 2011. Okay, so going back, that was the double pawns. Black not afraid to accept double pawns. So the more sensible looking move, Bishop D3, just developing his pieces. Queen B7, continuing with the plan to go to C, uh, C6 with the queen. E5, and here Black has a nice move, Knight D5. Knight d5 is good because after after uh, c takes d5 after c takes d5 after c takes d5 then the bishop d3 is hanging so c takes d5 bishop takes d3 rook d1 and queen a6 and that was a game from um, Ranieri De Luca versus Vihai Bach in Barcelona 2003. Um, now here, Black didn't win the C4 pawn, but he gains control over that square of C4, which is great. So check out the rest. So after D takes E6, F takes E6. Remember this pawn is pinned because of the queen here. So he takes, uh, F takes e6, knight h3, g5, bishop g3, castles queen side, knight f2, and bishop g6, rook c1. So now, white is actually threatening to play c4 here. He has a rook here and queen here. So, so guess what? Queen c4, making sure that he maintains control over that square. And knight takes c4. And black has a small advantage. He's attacking this pawn. Entrenched on this square. He can even go here if he needs to. And uh, basically, he just has the stronger minor pieces and, and a better pawn structure here. Okay, so let's go back. Alright, so that's bishop d3. And, and then there's knight h3, which is another reasonable move. Again, queen b7. Knight f2. Queen c6. Uh, queen b4 can be played, trying to avoid, avoid the trade. Queen takes c6. D takes c6. And notice, not knight takes c6. But d takes c6 so that black can maintain the pressure here on this pawn. Bishop takes f6. G takes f6. Knight g4. f5. Now you might say, well, why not just king e7? King e7, knight e3. 
the reason why F5 is better here is because black is able to eliminate this weak double pawn and at the same time attack the center so if the E takes E takes and white center is not as intimidating right both sides have weaknesses but black is a little better so for instance 93 F4 Knight G4 castles queen side castles queen side black is all right and instead of 93 the natural and tempting looking 95 f6 knight g6 rook g8 of course knight h4 f4 king f2 king d7 knight f5 Then h5, rook e1. So those prove to be some elusive pawns that are weak on the, uh, they're statically weak on the king side, but hard to capture. Rook a8, rook takes e8, rook takes e8. All right, so the rook takes e8, knight g7. Rook H8. Now that looks kind of passive, right? Def defensive move. Who wants to play that move? But it's understandable though, because Black is thinking if he doesn't defend that pawn, then the knight, the knight will simply capture on H5, and then uh, both F4 and F6 are. Or on prees. So he plays that move, but uh, rook e3 is the active move and natural move. So after rook h8, g3 was played, which I think is a little bit uh, suspect. Bishop takes c4, winning that pawn again. Bishop h3 check, king e7. G takes f4, king f7, knight f5, rook e8, knight e3, and bishop b5. And that game was a draw. And that game was between McCambridge and uh, Jenna Sasanko. And that's from New York, 1984. So, definitely some uh, double edge, double edged play. And black gets plenty of play in uh, these positions. Again, and that was just off of the alternative move, queen a4. But in this game, Yang played e5 immediately, not giving black the time to move his queen to c8. See, with the move uh, queen a4, then black has time to get out of that pen and then go with that plan. However, white chooses to forego that move and play e5 right away. Therefore, g5 is forced. Bishop f2, we already discussed. Uh, this is nothing. e takes f6, g takes h4 is just good for black, who's going to capture that pawn soon on f6. So g5, bishop, f2, and knight h5. A great move here by Ippolito. Other alternative is knight g8, which is not as strong because after queen a4, and basic idea here is to follow up with h4. Attacking uh, black's weakened... Um, uh, queen side, uh, king side pawn on g5. Now, what makes knight h5 more attractive here is that the pawn on g5 is there. And that, first of all, the knight, as, again, if you looked at the last video on this line, we spoke about 
the knight being trapped in in some lines after g4 because with this pawn on g7 the knight has no retreat square so after g4 and of course if um, f4 is guarded after g4 the knight often gets in trouble but with knight h5 with knight h5 then the knight can jump to f4 and also the knight has a retreat square if needed just simply go back to g7 so that's why it's uh, knight h5 is a, a more viable option here so h4 and once again uh, queen a4 is a viable uh, a viable option here to again protect that pawn so you see kind of the same uh, ideas popping up and here if queen a4 black can play the move f5 now one question that arises is well you see the two rooks on h8 and a8 at home queen on d8 why aren't we developing here you know for instance we move like queen e7 and uh castle and queen side and that's definitely a good idea there's nothing wrong with playing queen e7 and uh castling but there is an idea behind f5 which also makes it a viable move once white has induced g5 out of black he wants to rip open the queen side by playing h2 to h4 which allows the rook to be developed on h1 so therefore besides gaining space on the king side and also tempting white to take on passant which of course a strong play would not do here but besides gaining space on the king side he's also in a position to meet the move h4 right to meet this move h4 with g4 since now he has f4 so that is the idea so for instance f takes g4 f takes g4 queen c2 threatening queen to g6 queen e7 queen e4 bishop b7 queen takes g4 queen f7 followed by queen side castling and rook h to g8 hitting the queen and of course x ring to the g2 square and black has an excellent game with uh, pressure on both sides of the board so that's the idea ladies and gentlemen behind this move f5 so instead of um, instead of uh, playing h4 here what if white just castles on the queen side well queen e7 h4 now castle can be played it's, it's an option but remember what we just said before g4 is is perfectly viable and one of the one of the plans keeping the position closed but in this particular game castle king c2 then g4 was played now instead of king c2 maybe uh maybe uh black excuse me maybe white could have played this move but the problem is is the king is right here in this dark square also and he probably was worried about this check so therefore he decided to move the king to c2 but guess what now black has the time to play g4 and that is from the game Markson uh, Cautious Really Philadelphia Open 2010. Now White tried to play d5, but Black soon won the game after e takes d5, 
Rook takes d5, bishop b7. And then a uh, egregious error was made, knight d4. And then simply knight g3, and white was forced to resign. Okay. Now, let's look at the first line I discussed, which is E takes F6, which is uh, Black's dream, because White is basically destroying, building up his own center, and then destroying his own center, which is which is fantastic, and activating activating Black's pieces free of charge. So after E takes F6, Queen takes F6. It breaks down the white center and activates black queen. What more can you ask for from an opponent? Ladies and gentlemen, that is what I call a good host. Alright, so knight h3, knight f4. Knight takes f4, g takes f4. Excellent move. Again, when you start learning more about chess, you can see the power of such moves. Because now, you have a target here open file for the rook as a result of that capture capturing the queen is possible but wouldn't be as dynamic because then you're still kind of looking for possibilities for the rook here but here it provides opportunity because now this pawn is exerting pressure on e3 and also exerting pressure on g3 and then the rook is going to come to this open file so this game went h4 h5 now look at g3 and g2 now c5 bishop takes f1 king takes f1 rook g8 just as i said rook h2 this is a sorry state of affairs to have to do that with your rook Queen f5, looking at things like that, picking up this pawn, rook d1, and queen to d5. Now, why is queen d5 so powerful? Well, the answer to that is, as we've been looking at in the previous game and in this game, and preaching over and over that the c4 square is very very important controlling this square so control over that square is vital so with queen d5 now this knight can get in the game and that's why queen d5 is uh, a great move because it coordinates and it's like Michael Jordan used to do with the Chicago Bulls and LeBron James does with the Cleveland Cavaliers he makes his other teammates better so this move Queen D5 is a LeBron James move because it makes other teammates right if if black was the Cleveland Cavaliers this Queen would be LeBron James and this Knight would be like Della Vadova Right, and now since LeBron James made this great maneuver, now Della Vadova can shine, he can get in the game. So, rook e1, knight c4, and now look what has happened with this move f4, and that's the vision from earlier is bringing this point in because now opportunities arise with the knight coming to e3 if this bishop's not vigilant. In other words, what has happened is black has forced white into passivity. Queen c2, bishop takes c5, queen c1, c takes d4, c takes d4, rook f8. It's protecting that major asset, an f file, rook e2. Rook b8, king g1, and rook b3. And black 
went on to win in that game. All right. So we have seen major alternatives after the move queen a4 and f5. Although we have already said that queen e7 and castle is just fine. But back to our game at the knight h5. H4 was played immediately, and again, not uh, queen a4. So now here, Ippolito played f5. Now, what's interesting is we just said that one of the main ideas with f5 was to play g4 after h4. But here, white has already played h4, so it would seem like h5 is useless. Excuse me, uh, f5 is useless here because white can still capture on g5. Well, even though black doesn't have time for g4, the move f5 serves to slow white down on the king side. And so, instead of white, black allowing white to dominate on the king side, he basically launches a counterattack on the king side and he's fighting back on the on the same flank. Okay, so that's the idea behind f5. It's basically he's gonna fight back on the flank instead of just letting white run um rough shot over the king side. With that said, he can still just take the c pawn. So after bishop takes c4, h takes g5, queen takes g5, right? You don't want to take, you don't want to take with the um, with the pawn here because you lose, you drop a piece. After bishop takes c4, knight takes c4, g4. Remember all those variations we discussed earlier. Knight not having an adequate place to go. In this case, though, the rook the rook is just pinned. So the knight, even though the knight can come to g7, then the rook would be captured. So this is why the capture with the queen had to be made. Knight h3. And of course, not uh, not not bishop h4 because of the check. That would just come to queen e3, and then black would be winning. Because now he's going to attack this pawn next. So, knight h3, queen e7. Bishop takes e4, knight takes c4, g4, knight g7, queen a4, knight e5, knight f4. So, in this line where black takes the pawn right away we can see that white has driven black back and even though white is up a pawn white uh, black is up a pawn white has some compensation so for example h5 bishop h4 and h takes g4 and now the game gets really sharp as the queen is giving up rook takes King f2, rook takes a1, bishop f6, rook a2, king g1, rook a1, king f2, rook a2, with perpetual check. And that was a line given by Viktor Gavrikov. And again, that's like, you know, I know if I'm playing in black pieces, I'm not really trying to go in a line like that. So, even though that pawn can be taken, we can see why Ippolito plays f5 because he senses the mounting pressure on the king side. And he just wants to kind of slow it down a little bit before returning to the weakness on c4. Another note is if knight takes c4, because notice we when we did capture the pawn we took with the bishop. If knight takes c4 and queen a4 and um, black is um, pretty much busted here. This is um, attacked as well as this, and he just wins the piece. So, 
So, h4. F5 was played here. Again, e takes f6. Queen takes f6 would be a dream for black. It allows black to develop. And this actually happened with uh, Tiger and Petrosian, the world champion, with the black pieces against, against uh, Simogen in Moscow 1950. So let's see how that went. So at the c5, bishop takes f1, king takes f1, g4, same idea again. Right, keeping the position closed on the king side. And now the rook on h1 looks real suspect. Queen d3, castle king side, rook e1, knight f4, queen c2. Knight c4, and again, you see that utilization of the c4 square. g3, queen f5, and black is winning here. Can you see if what happens if queen takes f5? Mate, knight d2. Rook c1. Queen d3 check, forcing the trade of queens. Knight takes d3, rook d1, attacking the rook, rook a1, and g takes f3. And black won that game real easily in the game Simogen Petrosian in Moscow 1950. So that's why e takes f6 is just out of the question. Another option is, again, it's just c5, which is meant by bishop takes f1, and king takes f1. So now at this point, can you find how black can complete his development? Now remember, we've been talking about the c4 square. So by now you should see that queen c8 this idea of queen b7 or queen a6 check followed by queen side castling which connects the rooks is efficient for example in the game grandmaster volkov versus igor lesage in tom's 2006 rook b1 was played queen a6 check queen a2 which looks respectable but it's a blunder knight c4 again LeBron James, Della Vadova, utilizing, making, making the other players better. Rook b4, knight e3 check, and that move hurts right there. Can you see why? First of all, the queen on e2 is pinned. The bishop can capture, but then after the bishop captures, Right? Because King F1 was play King E1 was played. If the bishop captures, you should be able to see this, but I'll show you anyway. Knight G3 check, fork and everything. So King E1 is forced, and then Knight takes G2. Right? There's devastating 19, 18 moves and white. Is rated over 2600. G4 was tried. F takes G4, F takes G4, Queen B7. Again, there's the other option. Attacking this rook here. Rook H2. And if queen f3, then knight g3. The main idea behind that is if bishop takes g3, then rook f8 winning the queen. So, rook h2, knight f4, highlighting the usefulness of the move g5 again. 
h takes g5 and knight c4 there's that square again so black has the initiative for example g takes h6 queen e4 rook a2 knight f3 then just simply queen takes f3 because after queen takes f3 knight d2 check and the king cannot come here or here because of this knight covering these squares so after king g1 then there will be a fork after knight takes f3 so so after rook a2 rook f8 h7 knight g2 cutting off the rook from defense and setting up the threat of knight to e3 winning the queen so h8 queen knight e3 king e2 and queen takes g4 check and black is going to mate white in short order okay so let's get back okay all right back to the game so after f5 we looked at c5 we looked at um, F5 was played. We looked at E takes F6 here. We looked at C5. G3 has been tried in order to keep the knight from coming to F4. So G3. But besides keeping the knight from coming to F4. There is this idea of H takes G5, Queen to G5, and then F4. So, one game with uh, Burks and Almasi from 2005, Black played F5 just to, uh, F4 himself to meet that idea. Another idea here is king f7, connecting the queen and rook, so that black can meet h takes g5 with h takes g5 now, because this rook will be protected and not be hanging. But f4 was played, h takes g5, queen takes g5, knight h3, queen g8. G takes F4. There goes that C point again. And we have a equal game. Fine play for black. Okay. Let's go back. Okay. And finally, back to the game. After all those moves, E takes F6, C5, and G3. The simple H takes G5 was played. And it looks like the most consistent and logical move. Since black is forced to capture with the queen so he doesn't lose a piece after G4. So queen takes G5. Knight h3 with tempo on the queen. Queen g6. G4. Okay, and this move leads to big complications. F takes g4. B 
bishop d3 gaining tempo on the queen. And that move is forced because after f takes g4, then queen e4 just wins right on the right on the spot. The rook on h1 is hanging. So this in between move has to be inserted. Bishop d3, queen f7, f takes g4, and queen f7 simply prepared this move. Knight f4, knight takes f4, queen takes f4. And queen e2. And Ivalito castled kingside, which is a very enterprising move. I just wanted to show you that in another game, bishop g6 was inserted. And now black has to find out what's the best way to go with the king. Should you go to king f8, or should you go to e7, or d8? Okay, the answer is d8. And the idea is real simple, so go c8, and tuck the king away on b7, thus connecting the rooks. And that will come up a lot in these uh, positions. Alright, so queen, after queen e2, king c8. Queen e3, rook f8, queen takes f4, rook takes f4, rook takes h6, rook takes g4, c5, king b7, finally gets the king in the safety, bishop c2, rook f8, and black had a clear advantage in the game, aggressed Sokolov and St. Petersburg. 1993 so black's piece is a better coordinator at this moment and he has a better pawn structure so instead of this move bishop g6 which seems to disrupt black but in actuality helps him out queen e2 was played the Bolito castle on the king's side now Castling queenside is viable also. But after bishop e3, queen g3, bishop f2, queen e4, bishop e3, black either has to retreat the queen or accept the draw by repetition. So we can look at this move here as black playing for the win. Bishop h4. And after, for instance, instead of bishop h4 after g5, black can just ignore the threat of the capture since he is so um, well coordinated and play bishop takes c4 here. The reason why is because this queen was overworked, trying to protect the bishop on f2 and the one on d3. And as you can see, he cannot capture here on c4 with the queen. So instead, g takes h6, king h7, king is perfectly safe, rook g1, rook f5. And black is is slightly better here. Okay. <clears throat> so instead of g5, bishop h4 was played in the game. Bishop b7 was played simply attacking the rook. And rook g1 was played. Now can you find the move which gives white a decisive advantage here? Now with rook g1, white is thinking about the possibilities of uh, landing some kind of knockout blow, hoping one day to get this file open on uh, black. But it's actually black that's going to land the knockout blow. So, the key move here is knight b3. 
attacking this rook right here. Again, the knight does not conquer c4, but still gets in the game. And white probably overlooked the possibility. It's not so much about capturing this rook, which is the uh, threat, but the threat is coming the knight. It's knight c1, which is devastating. Bishop f6 was played. And to me, the move I would play immediately that I'm looking at is Bishop f3. This is a devastating move. See what Ippolito played. Yep, Bishop f3. So, in other words, he didn't get greedy and try to play knight takes a1 and g5 and then have to worry about his king safety. See, white will be right back in the game after that. Steady clamped down and kept creating creating more threats. So now you got rook f1. Right? And instead, if black tried queen f2, now you can play knight takes a1. Why? Because after g5, then queen c1 is just checkmate. Now that the queen, the white queen moved into the f2 square. So rook f1, bishop takes e2, just wins a piece. Bishop takes d3, rook a2, rook f7, rook h2, rook h7, rook f3, bishop g6, and white has breathed his last and resigns. So, in concluding, Bishop G5 is definitely looking like a more challenging move than uh, 8 Bishop D3. White played really aggressively uh, in this game, more so than in the first one. And another key point was that he was willing to just simply gambit away the C4 pawn in return for activity. So, Black could have taken the move on move, taken the pawn as we discussed earlier on move 12. But Ippolito chose to play f5, uh, which was, you know, basically fighting back on the king's side and basically putting position over material, as the great Capo Marco once said. And um, that's a, that was a great, uh, great fighting uh, effort uh, from both players here. So... <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed that game, and we'll be continuing with our next game in short order. So I hope you learned a lot from that. I know it was a long analysis, but uh, that's what it takes. Okay, so I will see you on the next one. Please like, subscribe, comment, any questions, leave them below in the box. All right, talk to you later.